Hello and welcome. My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted that you've joined us here today. I'm president of the Souza Mendez Foundation, and we honor a hero, a rescuer of World War II. And for many Sundays of the past three years, we've been presenting beautiful stories of rescue, resistance, and hope. And today is one such story. It's the story of Marcel Marceau, the famous mime, but what is not so famous about him is his wartime heroism, his wartime activities, working with his cousin, Georges Loinger, and the Ose Network of France to rescue Jewish children. He used his artistry to keep the children quiet as he helped them escape to Switzerland during the war. So today we have a very wonderful panel. We have the author and Holocaust educator, Joanne Gilbert, who has written two books about resistance during World War II. Following Joanne, we will meet the filmmaker, Mauritius Drukes, who's brought us this terrific film called The Art of Silence that has so many dimensions to it. After Mauritius, we will turn the floor over to my colleague of the Susan Mendes Foundation. Her name is Andre Lotte. She's a professor in Montreal, and she will be in dialogue with Mr. Daniel Loinger, son of Georges Loinger and cousin of Marcel Marceau, and he is coming to us from Paris. It's my absolute delight and pleasure to present to you Joanne Gilbert. And so Joanne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia. And I'm honored and grateful to be a part of today's wonderful program celebrating Marcel Marceau and his remarkable use of silence in saving Jewish children during the Shoah. This timing is particularly appropriate since 2023 marks 100 years since he was born in Strasbourg, France, not far from the border of Germany. Marcel and his older cousin, George Langer, grew up in a time that included World War I and its at aftermath, where Germany and France had been deadly enemies. The lessons and skills they learned would allow them to save many endangered Jews when the Third Reich occupied France in 1940 and targeted the Jews for extinction. To set the stage, so to speak, for today's program, here's a brief overview of some symbols and some people and events that related to French Jewish resistance to German oppression. Here we see on the bottom row, far left, the flag of France with which we are all familiar. In the center, we see the flag of Vichy France, which was led by Philip Pétain. And in the center, you see the double-sided ax, which indicates the superiority of the French people. On the right, you see the flag of de Gaulle's resistance of the free French forces. And in the center of that is the cross of the Wren, which also was an area near Germany that underwent a lot of turmoil and conflict between the two countries and is a sign of French strength and patriotism. On the top row, top left, we're familiar with the yellow patch, the Star of David that Jews were forced to wear during the occupation. And on the right at the top, you see the Star of David again, but this time in a symbol of resistance. In the center, we have the French Free Forces of the Interior Award, a pin that de Gaulle awarded to many uh, members of the French Jewish resistance, but not to all. Here we have the map of occupied France. In the yellow portion in the top and the far west coast is directly occupied by Germany. In the central south and east, we have what was known as Vichy. And that is where uh, Philip Pétain was the ruler. 
and you see the green demarcation line between both sectors. And on the left, we see uh, Charles de Gaulle, who became the leader of the Free French Forces, and he led his government in exile from London. Let's take a look at a couple of the cities that were very important during this time. We have in the, in the yellow, the German occupied zone, we have Paris, the heart of France, the city of lights, and the center of much of the resistance in the early days. Going down to the lower section, on the left we have Bordeaux, the city where Aristide de Souza Mendez conducted his remarkable rescue of several thousand Jews along with other refugees. The top center of the blue section, we have Vichy, a little spa town that became the center of the Vichy government. And to the right, slightly obscured by the demarcation line, is Geneva, right across the border from France. And it was an important place for sending uh, rescued Jewish children. Here we have three professionally staged glamour photos of Hitler's arrival in Paris, a city he had coveted. We see the top left photo, a chilling photo even today, of Nazi forces marching down the Champs Elysees from the Arc de Triomphe. Below it, another staged photo shows a German soldier on top of the Arc de Triomphe, waving his flag with a swastika. And on the right, in full force, we have Hitler and his minions beautifully centered in front of the Eiffel Tower. One of the first and most devastating legal acts to disenfranchise Jews in France was known as the Statue des Juifs. And these were laws that took away little by little the rights of Jews in France. Here we see Le Matin, the newspaper with its headline that the, the statues are promulgated, they are enforced. And on the right upper corner, we see an example of a notice on a formerly Jewish shop that had been Aryanized, meaning it had been taken from the Jewish owners and given to non-Jewish owners. Uh, they say temporarily, but it was not temporary. And beneath we have images of a little street park for Paris youngsters, unless they were Jewish. Jewish kids were prohibited. And then we have an image of one of the first roundups. And this would be of non-French born Jews, predominantly men, who were amongst the first who were rounded up and sent ultimately to Auschwitz to be exterminated. Here we have just two of the many uh, active resistance groups, the large Jewish army, Armée Juive, very large, very organized, holding the Star of David. And on the right, we have one of the smaller uh, Maquis units. These were originally uh, men who had run from forced labor um, in Germany and had run to the hills and formed their own little resistance groups. And gradually more and more people joined the Maquis. Here we have the major roundup that galvanized the entire country, Jewish and non-Jewish, to understand that they had to fight this occupying force. It was the Velodrome d'Iver, and it's known as the Veldiv. The Velodrome was a bicycle stadium that was very popular in the winter because it had a very tall, domed glass roof. And they could have many bicycle events and competitions throughout the winter. But in the summer, the heat through that roof proved to be deadly. 
The phone, the image on the left upper corner is a bus. It was probably a staged photo with a group of people that had been rounded up in the Valdiv roundup, and they were on their way via bus to the train station where they would then go to Auschwitz uh, to their deaths. The photo below that is particularly interesting because when I first saw it, it purported to be a shot of the prisoners, the Jewish prisoners. Over 13,000 were rounded up uh, July 16th and 17th, and it was crowded and hot and no food and no water and very little sanitary facilities, which were quickly um, put out of use. But a friend of mine who's a historian decided to track it down and she discovered that that photo is indeed staged. Those people don't look fear like they're in fear. They don't look hungry. Uh, they look like they're laying out at a beach. Um, and so that photo, which is largely attributed to being a scene from the inside of the Valdiv Roundup to show how good the Jews were being treated, uh, was staged afterwards. And on the right is the memorial to that roundup, to the innocent men, William, women, and children who were torn from their homes and forced into the velodrome for a couple of days. Um, an interesting note is that the Germans had wanted to stage the roundup on July 14th, which was Bastille Day, France's national holiday. And the forces of France discussed with Germans saying, this is our national holiday. We can't have a roundup that massive on that day. So the Germans graciously agreed to postpone the roundup until the 16th and the 17th. Here we have a very special uh, duet of images. On the right, we see Georges Langer's 108th birthday in 2018. Uh, I was honored to be a guest there and especially honored when George insisted I sit next to him and um, held my hand. With us is our dear mutual friend, the late Frida Wattenberg, who worked very closely with George and Marcel and an organization known as OZE in saving several hundred Jewish children. If you look at the bookshelf behind George's head, you will see in the center a photo of his cousin, Marcel, standing with Ben Gurion. Very, very powerful image. Frida, by the way, is chatting with Beat Klarsfeld, uh, a national hero also for her work in uh, hunting down Nazi war criminals. The image on the left is the book cover uh, of the book that George and Frida wrote together chronicling 600 uh, biographies of members of the Jewish French resistance groups. It's a beautiful book and her greatest wish, which she uh, conveyed to me, was to find someone to translate it into English. And so I am taking a moment to pass along that wish. Is there a group uh, of people who might break the, the book up and serve as translators so that everyone outside of France could know the story? The photo is taken in Animas and it's of the uh, children who had been rescued by George and uh, they're very, very happy to see freedom at last. Here we have, forgive my pronunciation, Ouvre de Secours aux Enfants, otherwise known as OZE. This is the organization uh, with which George and Marcel worked to save Jewish children. George was very, very intent on keeping the children physically fit because he was a phys ed teacher and believed in fitness. If you saw the movie, which I hope you will, if you haven't, you will see how strongly he believed in physical fitness. They never knew when danger would come and the kids would have to run for their lives or they might be stranded in a mountain somewhere. So he conducted classes at all the homes uh, that housed hidden Jewish children. Uh, 
that's okay. Uh, and here we have the cousins. Amazing, amazing guys. We would call them menches. We have them as George is receiving the uh, Medal of the Legion of Honor. And at that moment, Marcel had uh, another, uh, he was a little bit higher status in the badge recipient category, but it was a delightful evening for both of them. And now it is my absolute pleasure to be able to turn the program over to Maurizio, whose beautiful film is in itself a work of art. It is sensitive, multifaceted, and truly a film that I think everybody should be able to see. So thank you all for your attention. And here is Maurizio. Thank you so much, Joan, and welcome, everyone. I'm so happy that we can share this morning, or for me, actually, it's the evening. I'm sitting here in Zurich. I just say goodbye to my little daughter. And uh, the night is coming, and I'm really happy to share my experience, my thoughts working on this film, The Art of Silence, uh, about Marcel Massot, his art and his life. And I really hope you had the chance to see the film. I think it's still available for you if you did not have the chance yet. So actually, I just uh, want to share with you a bit of my personal experience doing this film. And first of all, when I started the film about six years ago, I was uh, 29 years old. I really did not know anything uh, <clears throat> about Marcel Mosso. Well, I knew a bit of it because my father, myself, my own father is a mime. So he used to do also like really funny mime numbers. And I really enjoyed this as a little uh, yeah, since childhood, I enjoyed all the mime numbers and I thought they were really funny and he brought us to love and I spent a lot of time with him doing a tour and like, yeah, being together with my father. It was such a light, delightful art. And uh, it was six years ago, I did another film. I was invited uh, to a dinner at a festival and I said to a elder, uh, to an old lady, she was sitting next to me and she told me that a mime had saved her life. So I was really surprised because just knowing the mime numbers of my father, which sometimes can be also really silly and childish, I was so surprised. How is this possible that a mime can save one's life? I mean, this is almost impossible. And actually, I tried to recontact this old lady, but the festival director told me that she already passed away, so I had no chance. And actually, she was uh, talking about uh, Marcel Masso, uh, who was, of course, also really famous mime, but as a young boy, he was not famous at all, and he was just a normal person. And uh, I learned about his Jewish heritage and uh, about him being involved in the resistance in France during that time. So I immediately knew that I kind of have to do a film about it uh, because my personal background is meeting a historical part which is so profound and shows such another side of what I was thinking this art is all about. So even my father did not know about this, you know, being a mime and doing almost the same num not mime numbers as Marceau, he was also surprised. So I had a big urge to do this film, but I was really, I, well, not afraid, but I had a, a lot of respect, but because my myself, I did not know Marce Marcel Marceau at all. I had no contact to his family or close people. So I just jumped into this project and I tried to contact the family muscle and they told me about their father. They were really nice, but, but I realized they did not really experience this period of time. I was interested in it. By that time, I really built up a whole film team and we had about 3000 hours of archive material. But you have to imagine that Marcel Masso at a certain point after the war, he became really famous. So there's a lot of film material about him being famous, 
doing big numbers and being really joyful, but he did not really spoke about this war time in front of a camera or television. So I had 3000 hours of material I tried to use for my film, but all this material was not really about what I was interested in it. So I kind of, I kind of had to search people who could experience this uh, period. And I was lucky enough that I learned about his cousin, George Loinger, and the cousin's son, Daniel Loinger, who is luckily here. I'm so happy I can re re meet Daniel here. I haven't seen him for so long, so we will be in, uh, in conversation later on. So I just got to know them and they were alive. They were living in Paris and I live in Zurich, Switzerland in Zurich. It's not so far. So I just took the train. I called Daniel and he was like, yeah, of course you are inviting our flat. I could come by. And I was really, uh, I, I think I was lucky enough to meet um, Georges because at that time uh, he was really still a young person. He was 104 years old. He was uh, telling me, well, you're lucky. I'm still, I'm still young. I'm ready to talk to you in front of the camera. And um, he told me uh, everything about uh, the French resistance and Daniel joined the camera as well. You saw a photograph uh, some minutes ago sitting uh, together on the table and it was really a nice experience for me to learn more about uh, that time about the time of the invasion of the Nazis, how how they had to hide themselves, create their new identities to become somebody else and uh, to try to not get caught by the Gestapo. So I was confident enough at the time to start really this film project. And on one hand, I had now these witnesses people who were telling me the stories. On the other hand, I had this archive material and I was always trying to find a way to bring this together because what really struck me about uh, this project was also the personal story of Marcel, uh, who was um, a son of a Jewish butcher and uh, 1940, he was deported by the Gestapo and brought to Auschwitz and killed there. But Marcel, during the whole war time, he did not really know what was happening to his father. Of course, seeing back on the time, it was clear that he was deported and killed. But I think Marcel was still this difficult time. He was full of hope, full of joy, trying to to discover his father or to rescue him or to be able to see him. And one of his big trauma I learned from all his family members was that he never could meet his father again. I mean, he did not even had uh, kind of a, a body to see that his father is really dead. So he was constantly in this, in this awareness of maybe my father is coming back and, uh, I thought this is such such an um, interesting point for me because what what he's doing the mime art is exactly the opposite. So imagine being a mime; it means you're playing something uh, which becomes visible and true for us in our Im imagination, but it is not touchable. You know, there's nothing there. You can't kind of touch it, and this same formula was was kind of his traumatism that he could not touch his father again he could not hold him again and say him goodbye and he was i think he was constantly uh traumatized or struck by this feeling but he tried to do something beautiful out of it he tried to do an art form out of it and i think bring this this traumatic and painful parts together with with uh, with beautiful and and visionful uh, thoughts, you know. So this was something really strong I wanted to tell with my film, and which is hopefully kind of uh, in my film. And um, 
for, for, for the end of my speech right now, I'd like to share a small clip with you, which kind of tries to combine this. So I found in his personal archive, a clip where Marceau, a video clip where Marceau is kind of playing that a friend of him, it could be in a wartime, but it could also be his father, is just dying next to him and how he's grabbing this person. And I learned that a lot of people did not understand the number because the number was shot in silent. So filming mime is something different than experience mime on stage. So what I did is I collected a lot of audio material. I, uh, I, um, I extracted breathing sounds of Marceau and I got his personal uh, clothing so I could re putting his clothes on and reenact his uh, his movements and record them audio. So I recreated the whole audio of him being on stage and combined it with the archive I found to make it kind of visually audio visually uh, al alive again for this film. So for the end, I'd like to share this small clip with you. Yeah, so to sum up, I think a really touching experience for me was that Marceau was bringing his art to all over the world, uh, but he did not really spoke about what he experienced in, in public so much. So everyone was just laughing and having a great time, but I think something really terrible also uh, influenced his art and I think he tried to overcome his, his his traumatic experience by doing this art and this is something for me really a hero somebody I really appreciate for doing this uh, that he, he's trying to to find a new way of living or to doing an art uh, by bringing all the experience together and 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 facing the uh, the future, and one of the person who was doing this also really strong is Josh Loinger, and his son Daniel Loinger, who is here. So I'm really happy to hand over the floor to Andre Lotte, Professor Andre Lotte, who is in conversation with Daniel Loinger. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mauritius. Your movie is so compelling and gave me, and I'm sure all the audience, such a better understanding of Marcel Marceau and, and the impact that he would have in our lives today. My father was saved by Aristide de Souza Mendes. I have a fascination for rescuers. And for me to have the opportunity to be in conversation with Monsieur Daniel Loinger, son of Georges Loinger, cousin of Marcel Marceau, is an extreme privilege. Um, we've covered, uh, we've, well, hello, Danielle. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Very well. We've had the opportunity to speak uh, at length about uh, some aspects of the rescue missions of your incredible father. And one of the things that started us on the conversation is, is a hook also to the movie of Mauritius is we were talking about Marcel Marceau's father, who was a kosher butcher, Charles Mangel. 
And I would like you to tell us about um, the, you, you talked about it, uh, Mauritius, but we, could you please tell us about um, his uh, dramatic uh, end? And you, you had some very powerful insight for me, um, Daniel. Okay, so uh, the, the, the father of Marcel Marceau uh, was a butcher, but not only a butcher, he was also a hazard, I mean, a singer. In the in the synagogue, yes. And uh, the war came. He was in Limoges, a small town in the center of France. And um, people tell him uh, stop singing during outside the, the synagogue because uh, it just happened that the commandature of Limoges, the the um, uh, officer, German officer and Gestapo was just few uh, hundred meters from the shop. <clears throat> How dangerous. So finally, of course, what happened is that uh, the German realized that there was uh, just close to their office, uh, the uh, uh, butcher, which was a Jew and speaking uh, speaking, uh, Hebrew, in the middle of the war, in a small town, uh, people singing about Jew. Of course, he was arrested and disappeared in Auschwitz. This is so dramatic. And and um, Danielle, tell us also that, so we understand that he disappeared. It was also a bit of an act of defiance on his part because he was singing, even though it was very risque because the commandeur, as you said, was on the same street as the butcher shop. How dangerous was that? And Danielle, could you please tell us uh, some of the activities, describe the activities of your father, Georges Loinger and Marcel. They were active together in the resistance. They were in the underground army providing in information. Could you tell us uh, some, some about, uh, something about this, please? So actually, um, there were some children who came to France from Germany and uh, they were from uh, family, Jewish family, which have already taken by uh, uh, the, the German and uh, in the camp. So those children were uh, gathered in 32 uh, house, castle sometime, or house, 32 house by Ose, or Sudu was often, and uh, to, uh, to protect them from not being alone because there were no much uh, parents. So and the they, children were orphans and they had to be gathered and they had to be taken care of and they were German, so they, I understand. And uh, the uncertainty, uh, uncertainty, but in the 42, the uh, chief doctor of Ose said that to a big meeting of all the, the responsible of uh, all the um, um, uh, organization that we know not for sure that the German intend to destroy all the Jewish of Europe. So yes. The conference in, in Lyon. And uh, in this case, we have to stop our policy of gathering people in the, in the house, in the countryside, for the contrary, to bring them outside of France, uh, what, what, to Switzerland, but not only Switzerland, to bring them outside of France, to uh, to be to be uh, to be saved. That's and, right. So the children were in very in grave grave danger. You, your father understood that with Maso, and they had to take them to safe haven because they were threatened. They did speak the language, correct? They didn't speak French. They would have been identified. They want to speak, they want to eat only kosher because they say, when my parents come back, if, they, if we have not eaten the proper way eat the food, they will not accept us. So, so finally, uh, uh, the, the organization Jose, decided to bring all those children in Switzerland. That's right. And, and uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, there was something that was very, very important in their role is that they were carrying your, your father and Marcel, they were carrying the money, they were transporting the money to be able to bring those children, correct? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, the, the point is 
that uh, the, the smaller city where they were uh, standing before going to Switzerland was Anmas. Yes. And it happened that in Anmas, the mayor of Anmas, Defo, was uh, very much for the underground army, for the resistance. And so my father uh, went to see him and uh, the, uh, this Monsieur Defo said to my father, okay, we are, uh, we are going to help you uh, to pass the, the children. They knew that it would cost money because actually um, my father could not uh, bring the children to Switzerland. It was a few hundred meters uh, in France and the last passage was done completely secret by those people from the region, mountain people, and people from Anmas, people from the region. And they were getting a lot of money of this passage. So the idea was we pass the, the children and then they came back, say the children have passed and they give us the money. So you were very lucky that you were, could count on, that your father could count on the mayor who was favorable to the rescue of the children to pass them. They had to gather so much money to be able to bring them to safe haven and then uh, to pass in Switzerland. So they were called les passeurs. These people demanded money to, to bring the children. And Danielle, you were saying that your father, um, you were telling me about your own rescue. Could you tell us about, it's, it's a miracle that you are here today to speak to us. Please tell us about your own rescue with your fathers. So it just happened that uh, the, at a certain period, the Italian, uh, when Mussolini was uh, taken and killed, the uh, Italian army who were in, uh, in, in care of seven departments in France, went back to Italy. And the German replaced them. And at that time, the joke was over. Uh, the, the German army, as usual, very organized. Uh, not letting pass anybody. And uh, finally, uh, the Ose said to my father, we have to stop passing the people to children. It's beaucoup, uh, much too dangerous. Yes. To and uh, so we were the last one to pass. You and were the last ones to pass because once the Italians left, there was no, the danger with the Germans was way bigger. So your father said, we have to go now. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, we have been taken. We are for 14 people, 14, uh, in, uh, four plus, uh, and we were taken by uh, the German and uh, uh, by uh, the, the small German uh, team of 10 people. They got huge dogs, a German big shepherd. And uh, the officer said to this uh, to his dog, you stay here. And of course the dog uh, stay in front of my father with the big teeth, and uh, this gentleman want to collect all the people who were uh, around, trying to collect them. And uh, they discussed a few minutes before he left the my father. And a very strange thing happened. Uh, Strasbourg at that time, uh, before the war, the First World War, was German. So many people, like my father, have been all studying preparatory uh, school, with the German uh, uh, people. So he, he could look very much at German. And it's happened, this is the only explanation, uh, because suddenly this officer called back his dog, just like that. The dog rushed toward the, my uh, visitor. And uh, of course, my father used uh, this time to bring us crossing a river. It was just a river here. So we crossed the river because the river stopped, the, the dogs cannot smell, uh, feel something with, uh, with, with water. And uh, we finally find a house who, who kept us for the night. And the next morning, at five o'clock in the morning, we, 4th of April, we went through the... Through the so so and, this is unbelievable because, because your father was so elegant and eloquent and spoke German, he was about to be taken. The German soldier leaves him in the, with his dog, with his big teeth, who was about to, to you know, eat him up, 
But luckily, the German officer who was sensitive to your father whistled his dog back, in which time your father and was able to take you across the river and escape. So luckily, the Swiss were very firm about not letting you go back to the Germans, and they protected you as well. All, all, this, all this had huge consequences on your father and Marcel Marceau. Um, after the war, it must, was it possible for your father and Marcel to be around children or there was trauma? My, my father was a professor of uh, gymnastics before the war. And yeah. uh, say after the war, to hear a child uh, uh, crying, it was impossible because he, he remembered till he was till he before died. Uh, he, he could remember every day, actually, every day the last few years of life. He was speaking to us about the children passage, crying in the, in the night and awfully afraid that the Germans arrive with a rifle and take the children. And it never stopped uh, to think and to get his uh, feeling about these children. So your father was a true hero and he was haunted for the rest of his life by the cry of those children and the sounds. And, and it affected him dearly. Monsieur Daniel Ouinger, we are forever grateful for this testimony and we will be absolutely all interested in knowing more about you, your father and Marcel Marceau. And now, thank you so much. We could see here Monsieur Loinger with, with you and your brother. And uh, it is extraordinary. He received uh, the highest honors for his actions as a resistant, Les Commandeurs de la Légion d'Honneur in Paris in 2005. You have so much to be proud of. And today we honor his memory. Um, thank you. Olivia, I will hand the floor to you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you to our speakers. I encourage the audience to continue putting their questions into the chat box. We'll get to your questions in just a moment. Right now, it's my job to tell you about upcoming programs. So there's a brand new book that's been giving, getting rave reviews, and we're going to have a book launch for the author next week. It's called In the Garden of the Righteous. And the author is Richard Horowitz. It's, it's a book that's gotten a lot of press. It's about rescuers during World War II. So please join us next week for that program. We do have books for sale that the author will be signing and inscribing. And so after today's program, you will get an email with a link to that program. And there is a PayPal link to purchase the book. And then we will reach out to you to find out which inscription you would like. You can give it to yourself as a gift or to a loved one. And inspiration is always a wonderful gift. So I encourage you to sign up for that program. It is a free program. Two weeks from now, we turn to a completely different story. And that's the story not of a hero, but of a, a famous uh, person and a turning point in Holocaust remembrance and Holocaust accountability, I would say. This is a film that we're going to show about Kurt Waldheim. It's mm -hmm. called Waldheim's Waltz. And uh, the filmmaker Ruth Beckerman has shown the what? moment in 1986 where, um, where uh, Waldheim was running for president of Austria after having been the secretary general of the United Nations. And suddenly it was revealed that he had a Nazi past. So um, this was, of course, a big scandal. And this is the story that the film tells. So the ch central figure, Kurt Waldheim, is decidedly not a hero. But there are numerous heroes in the film, uh, Hubertus Chernin, who first uncovered the story, the World Jewish Congress that uh, held press conferences and protested against the Waldheim presidency, and uh, Congressman Tom Lantos, who at the time was the only Holocaust survivor in Congress. So these are all fascinating figures and groups uh, that were a counterweight to uh, Kurt Waldheim and his, um, his uh, 
his deceit, I guess, is the best way to put it. So that's a very interesting film, Valheim's Waltz. And right now we're going to show you a little trailer to entice you to sign up for that program. Ich erinnere mich an seine Hände, sein Lächeln. Er schien sein Volk umgreifen, umschlingen zu wollen. The New York Times reported today that Kurt Waldheim, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, was attached to a German army command during World War II, which engaged in mass deportation of Greek Jews. A, he was a Nazi. B, he's a liar. And C, he was present at places where war crimes were committed. I was not a member. It was eingetragen by Verwandten. Es handelt sich hier um eine groß angelegte Verleumdungskampagne einer ganz kleinen, allerdings sehr einflussreichen Gruppe, auf die Medien einflussreichen Gruppe. Die äh, ehrlosen Gesellen vom jüdischen Weltkongress. Wir lassen uns daher von niemandem Hass und Zwietracht in unser Land hineintragen. Wer beherrscht die Welt? Wer? Der Deutsche oder der Jude? Wer beherrscht die Welt? Wer? Wer? Du gescheiter, du. Das ist kein Teufel. Der Mensch ist katholisch. Sie werden nichts finden. Wir waren anständig. So that Waldheim affair from 1986 was a turning point in so many ways, including, I think, in our own story about Susan Mendes, which also was brought to light in that same year, 1986, because governments could no longer say they didn't know, they didn't see, etc. So it's quite an interesting period of history. You probably all remember, but here's a chance to really delve deeply in that moment in time. So now let's turn to your questions. So first of all, I wanted to say that there are a number of people in our audience who either personally were rescued by the OSE network or their mother was rescued or another relative was rescued. So it's like almost a family reunion we have here in our audience today, which is so interesting. And Joanna, Joanne, I wanted to also mention that there's someone in our audience who is volunteering her services to help with translation. So maybe we will see how we can get that going. Now let's go to the actual questions. So we have several people who want to know more specifically um, about the rescue operation. How did this network find the children? How did they get them to Switzerland? I mean, we want more details about the, the mechanics of how this happened. The, the Jewish community in France, as in most countries, most European countries, had many, many groups, political groups, religious groups, social groups, and they had a network already in place, particularly the Boy Scouts had a network already in place. And so when it became obvious that the children had to be saved, then um, Jose and Marcel and George already had uh, routes that they could follow, uh, networks that they could follow to find these children. It, the story of how they were able to get their parents to give them up is a whole other program. And uh, they were able to place them in 32 homes that were sometimes called chateaus or castles, uh, where they had schools and uh, art classes and all kinds of recreational programs for them. It's a huge question. We don't, and I'm sorry, I don't have time to give you a better answer. Now, Mauritius, in your film, you focus on uh, Marcel Marcel's grandson, who's such yeah. a fascinating young man, 16 years old and so poised and so articulate and so sure of himself. Louis Chevalier, there's a question, first of all, is he related at all to Maurice Chevalier? It's kind of a common name, Chevalier. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I don't think so, but I never asked him this, but I think I, I should have, I should know. Uh, if it was the case, but he is not. Uh, yeah, it's the father, uh, Louis' father is called Chevalier, so he took the name and he's not part of this family. 
But maybe to talk, maybe I can talk two, three sentences about Louis, which is kind of the grandson uh, of Marcel. And he, in the film, he says also he had a, he had not, not really a chance to get to know his grandfather. So he had a period where he was kind of angry about his grandfather or the circumstance that everyone sees him as the grandson and yeah you have a lot of your grandfather uh, and a lot of talent so on but he's like not well actually i did not really know my fa grandfather so still there's something in him which keeps him uh vivid and artistic and alive and and this this trans transgenerate generation questions were were really interested for me so what do we keep on uh, uh, what do we do we pass on in our families uh and how can we uh keep our values or artistic language in our families and and what will disappear so it's not uh it's not the thing we can um decide <laughs> always it's just happening or not and for the film it was really nice to spend a lot of time with louis because i could kind of also bring this young atmosphere of a young person who's searching his way in this world yeah i could film this and this was something really important i wanted to show because i like i said i had no material about my soul uh at his young age, you know, so um, for me, it was really interesting to see uh, Marceau not only uh, becoming somebody else in order to survive to create a new identity, but to see somebody who's really inventing personalities. I mean, Bip, the person who he got really famous with the artistic person is an invention. So he kind of learned how to use your all your imagination and all you your power to invent invent a personality and to become this personality so this is something which really struck me that it is not about playing or pretending to be somebody else it is also about really being somebody else Mauritius, I have to tell you that I've now seen your film several times, watched it all the way through several times. And that's because it has so many layers that I felt I had to watch it several times to really get everything from it. So I just wanted to commend you for making such a jewel of a film that teaches us so much on so many subjects. So, uh, and Thank I you. also wanted to make one more point, which is that I understand that Marcel Marceau and Georges Loinger both have been honored by the B'nai B'rith, which honors Jewish rescuers. They've both received the Jewish rescuers citation, which is so important because it's important to give credit where credit is due. So now let's turn to the final thoughts of our speakers. So Joanne, let's start with you. What would you like to share in closing with our audience? Well, great gratitude to you and to the panelists, Audre, Danielle, Mauritius, and for all of the people who joined us today. I'm reminded that we recently had International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and we often hear the phrase, never forget. I am grateful to you, Olivia, and your organization for putting action to those words. Every week you provide us an opportunity to become actively involved in never forgetting. As a Holocaust educator, I hope that people who believe it's important to carry on these stories will find it in their hearts to contribute to organizations that are providing Holocaust education. Thank you. Daniel, are there words that you would like to say in closing? And I believe you're muted. So if you could unmute yourself and say a few words to our audience, that would be wonderful. My father used to say, few months more, I will not exist. The, 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 the pressure was so much on this so small team of underground army that uh, uh, we were really condemned to, to, be, to be kept one for good. And um, I want also to say two things. 
of hope. Uh, the people of uh, Anmas were all together helping those few people like my father to save the children. The, nobody spoke about those uh, uh, children in the in small gathering house. Uh, the people during the night, they got money, but still they did a very dangerous work. So all the population on this region was actually helping Thank you, Mr. Louanger, for the personal testimonial. You're bringing us there. It's important to have eyewitnesses with us sharing their memories because uh, that's how we learn. So Mauritius, the final word goes to you. What would you like to say in closing? Well, thank you so much for doing this. And I want to thank all the protagonists in my film. So I just come with my little camera. A film, doing a film is such an intimate journey but at a certain point the film gets a uh, public and i'm really happy that our film can now travel the world to a lot of countries and it will be seen by a lot of people and i think for me it's really a chance uh that i could discover uh such stories and meet people i mean everything is just based on personal memories and test testimonies but i think this keeps it really alive and now we are crossing a time where a lot of people who experienced this uh, this this war time are passing away. So for me, film is a central media who can also tell stories. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy that you do it and invite also a lot of other films. That's really great to see as a filmmaker. Great. So thank you to the panel. Thank you um, to also André Lotte for being in dialogue with Mr. Loinger. Thank you to our wonderful audience that comes week after week. Please join us next week and in the weeks to come. Bye-bye, everybody. Be well. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>